Yes, my wife cheated on me, and yes, she left me for another man. And yes, at first I was filled with rage and wanted to destroy both of them, but that never happened. Still, I suppose this is a revenge story, but I never intended it to be so. My name is Randy Clipson, and I'm just an average guy. I'm not a hunk. In most of my life, I was overweight in high school. That changed because I played football, and it was because of football that I got my nickname Chipper. They used to say that if I chipped someone, they were going down. When you're six feet three inches tall and weigh 260 pounds, you're kind of expected to play football. I was not a great athlete, but I had considerable upper body strength even in high school and could push defensive linemen backward. Playing football really helped me a lot through those four years of school. First of all, I shed most of the fat I had carried around most of my life. Even though I still had a bit of a belly, the muscle I had accumulated more than offset that. Nevertheless, when you've been fat most of your life, you tend to think of yourself as a fatty. Add to that mindset, I was painfully shy because I had been teased about my weight all through grade in middle school. Now, in high school, I was a football player and no one made fun of Maine anymore. Being on the football team also came with certain privileges. I was no longer a pariah amongst the girls. Don't get me wrong, I didn't attract the cheerleaders, but some girls were more than willing to go out with me. Still, I didn't date very much until my senior year. That was when I met Cindy. Cindy Crawley had transferred into our school toward the end of my junior year, so even though she was in my class, I didn't take notice of her until senior year. Cindy had the most beautiful face I had ever seen. However, she was at least 30 to 40 pounds overweight. This turned off most of the boys in my class, and I'm not proud to admit it, but I wasn't interested in Cindy at first either. It wasn't until we were paired up in chemistry that I really got to know her. Chemistry for me was more than complicated, but not for Cindy. So she helped me a lot. I would go so far as to say that if it wasn't for Cindy, I would have failed chemistry and probably not gone to college. Also, while we were partners, I learned how friendly and funny she was. I also found out that we had something in common. We had both started school late. Cindy had had a congenital heart defect that one and a half years A to correct. I was born at the end of the year, and then my parents decided to hold me back a year. That meant that Cindy and I were both 19. It took all my courage, but finally, I decided to ask her out. I think she was suspicious of my intentions at first. I really couldn't blame her. As bad as my early school years had been, hers had been much worse. She was always the target of cruel pranks and taunting. Still, she reluctantly agreed to go out with me. It was a simple date where I just took her to the movies and then out for an ice cream soda. It was a fun date, but I was too shy to try and kiss her. Instead, I shook her hand and asked if I could call her. I could see she was thrilled. We went on several dates over the next several weeks. By the third date, I had worked up the courage to give Cindy a kiss on the cheek. Then we progressed to necking with me making it to first base. The more I saw of Cindy, the more I cared about her. While my budding romance was lumbering along, the football season was moving in a surprising direction. My high school Kevin High had never been much of a football powerhouse, but this season all the stars seemed to be aligning. Kirk Simmons was our star quarterback, and we had the Bailey twins, Todd and Jason, as our running backs. I was now the left tackle, and I protected Kirk's blind side. I did a reasonably good job and that Kirk was never sacked by anyone coming around my end. We had lost our first game of the season to Mohawk High 21-17. Mohawk High had always been a perennial football power. After that game, we ran off seven straight wins and advanced to the regionals. We made it all the way to the state finals before Towson High put us down 28-14. However, it wasn't all bad. We ousted Mohawk High in the semifinals 38-7. That was very satisfying. I'm sorry I don't get to relive the glory days of high school football very often. I couldn't resist. Anyway, my romance with Cindy continued and we had advanced. To second base. When prom season arrived, I immediately asked Cindy to be my date. She squealed with delight and accepted with a big, huge kiss. During the four weeks before the prom, Cindy went on a crash diet. She lost about 20 pounds to fit into the prom dress she had purchased. When I picked her up for the prom, my eyes almost popped out of their sockets. Even though she was still what most guys would consider fat, I thought she was gorgeous. Cindy had always had big breasts, but they had never been so noticeable until I saw her in that light blue prom dress. The dress barely contained her breasts as they threatened to spill over the top. 
The night was a dream for both of us as we danced with each other the entire evening. When the evening came to a close, I wanted to go parking with Cindy, but she had other ideas, directing me to a wooded area about 30 miles outside of town. Cindy explained that her uncle had a small cabin he used when he wanted to go hunting. The cabin was indeed small. It only had a tiny kitchen, a couch in front of a television, a bed, and a bathroom. We started on the sofa with our usual fooling around. Ended the night being a happy guy, even with our extracurricular activities. I got Cindy back to her house 15 minutes before her curfew of 2 a.m. Cindy and I remained closed throughout the rest of high school. We had sex whenever we could, but always careful to use a rubber. With graduation, I have been offered a partial scholarship to play football for a Division II school two states over. Cindy opted to attend the local community college. My major was computer science and hers was psychology. Since I was going away to school, we discussed what we should do about our relationship. By mutual agreement, we decided to break up. We felt that it wasn't fair to tie the other down. It was the hardest decision I had ever made. I can't even explain how horrible I felt going off to school and leaving Cindy behind. She told me that if we were meant to be together, we would. I was terrified I was going to lose her. I was hurting so badly. When I arrived at Mountain Ridge University, I almost headed straight home. But I couldn't do that. I had made a commitment to the university and I would honor it. Besides, I really wanted to get a college education. The only thing that I could think to do was to throw myself into my football practices and my schoolwork. From the time I woke up until I laid my head on my pillow at night, I pushed myself to keep my mind occupied. My coaches and my teachers were impressed by my work ethic, even though the coaches advised against it. I took a full load of classes. One thing about being a college football player, they burned the last of my fat off and replaced it with muscle. That combined with all the weight training and I had not only upper body strength, but lower body as well. Since I only had a partial scholarship, my parents had to cover the balance. I knew they were struggling with the cost, but since I was playing football, I couldn't help financially. I had no money to come home, but I called Cindy every week. She seemed as devastated by her split up as I was. My first year of college came to an end, and it had been successful from a football and academic standpoint. I have been inserted into the starting lineup by the third game of the season. I was too slow to play tackle, so they moved me inside to play left guard. My added strength allowed me to open holes for our running backs, and we finished the season with an 8-2 record. Academically, I ended the year on the Dean's List. My parents were thrilled. During the summer, Cindy and I picked up where we had left off. I was now head over heels in love with her, or at least that is what I believed at the time. I have gone back and forth as to whether we were indeed in love or just in lust, after much thought. I think for me anyway, it was love because a small part of me still loves her. I worked during the summer and took three online courses. I was hell-bent to finish college as soon as possible. Cindy and I picked up our sexual activities. Also, I was exploring her body every way I could, every chance we had. I finished college in three years and married Cindy right after graduation. We both took jobs with the same multinational software and electronics company in Virginia, Triorbit Electronics. I worked in software development and Cindy worked in human resources. After two years, we had saved up enough money to buy a small house and started talking about having a family. Our first three and a half years a of marriage were great, except for one thing. We both had put on a tremendous amount of weight. Cindy had ballooned to 230 pounds and I was topping the scales at 310 pounds. I could carry the extra pounds better than Cindy because of my height. Neither one of us was happy about the excess weight, but neither one of us could stick to any diet, as far as I was concerned. I loved Cindy no matter what size she was. After three years of marriage and no kids, we consulted our family doctor. After running a series of tests, he found nothing wrong with either of us, but suggested that we lose some weight. He felt that it might help Cindy conceive. So, for the first time in our lives, we went on a strict diet after six months. Cindy was down 50 pounds. I was only down about 25, but I have to admit that I cheated more than I should. The loss of weight on Cindy was noticeable. I could see that men were starting to eye her like they had never done before. In addition to the diet, Cindy began going to the gym five days a week. As I watched her transformation, I realized I had to get my acting gear. 
I started staying strictly on our diet and starting hitting the gym with her. At the end of one year of dieting, Cindy had shed 80 pounds and I had lost 90. We were both feeling really good about ourselves, but sadly our weight loss was going to bring me a broken heart. As Cindy continued to lose weight, she began dressing in more and more revealing clothing. At first I really enjoyed it, but when I started overhearing some of the comments at work I was not pleased. But I couldn't really say anything because for her whole life, Cindy had been an ugly duckling. Now she had turned into a beautiful swan. The real problem for me was when Kirk Simmons was appointed head of human resources. He was now a senior director of the company. I was just a senior programmer. He was now two levels above me and he was now Cindy's boss. At first I didn't think anything of it. Kirk was married to Susie Looper, who had been a cheerleader in high school. I had seen her at company functions and she was still quite attractive. I would have hardly noticed her, except that my wife asked me to dance with her while she danced with her boss. I danced with Susie a couple times at a Christmas party while Kirk danced with Cindy. I have to admit that dancing just apart from her, I got hard. That was no big deal because still, being in my 20s, any pretty girl could elicit the same result. But one thing I was pleasantly surprised about, she was not a stuck-up snob. I didn't recognize you or Cindy when Kirk and I arrived. Susie complimented us. You guys look fabulous. I always thought Cindy had a beautiful face, but now she's a knockout. You better keep an eye on her. Thank you, that's very kind. I said a little embarrassed. You guys look fabulous. Also, Kirk looks the same as he did in high school, and you look even better. Thank you. That's really sweet of you. Susie blushed slightly as the music ended five months before our fourth anniversary. Cindy informed me that she was going back on birth control pills. What about having kids? I objected. I've decided that I don't want any right now, she said bluntly. Oh, just like that, you've decided I was angry. Look, we'll have kids, she said as she stroked my arm. I just don't want to get fat again. I want to enjoy being slim for a while. I should have known that there was a problem right then, but I was clueless. I trusted Cindy completely. Unfortunately, I could trust Kirk as far as I could throw a bus. Unbeknownst to me, Kirk had put on a full court press to get Cindy. She, of course, was flattered beyond belief that the former football captain of our high school team was pursuing her. I first became concerned when Cindy began working late and then going supposedly. Out with girlfriends, I was genuinely clueless about these things. But I'm not stupid. When Cindy started coming in later and later, I became suspicious. I didn't want to believe that she was cheating on me, but I couldn't ignore the signs. I hired API Company, and inside of a week, they had all the evidence I needed. They had a video of Cindy and Kirk having sex in the office. How they got that, I have no idea. They had pictures of them cuddling at dinner. They had videos of Kirk coming to my house while I was at work. And lastly, they had pictures of them having sex on our living room floor. I knew they took those through the front window of our house. Remember when I said that I couldn't really describe what it was like having sex with Cindy the first time? Well, I have no words to explain the pain that I felt finding out that my wife was cheating on me. Not only that, but she was cheating with someone who had been a friend of mine. Granted, Kirk and I were not close, but I had still considered him a friend. It hurt. Unbelievably. I still held out hope that once I confronted Cindy, she would come to her senses. I was in love with her, and I thought she was still in love with me. I took the evidence home that night and after dinner. I told Cindy we needed to talk. She looked at me curiously but sat at the kitchen table to listen. Cindy immediately turned white and then buried, her face in her hands. She started to cry and ran to the bathroom. I went and knocked on the door, but she refused to open it. I waited in the kitchen with a glass of rum. Finally, she came out and sat down at the kitchen table with her head down. What do you have to say? I said coldly. I didn't mean for it to happen, she said in a voice just above a whisper. Oh, your clothes just happened to fall off, and he accidentally stuck his dick in you. You don't have to be crude, Cindy flared. If you had paid more attention to me, this wouldn't have happened. I was taken aback, and for a second I thought that maybe I had neglected her. But then my anger flared. Don't try to turn this back on me. I've done nothing wrong. You're the one who is having an affair. You've been caught. What do you have to say for yourself? She looked nervously at me, but said nothing. So what are we going to do about this? I was fighting to keep my anger under control. Do you want to be with Kirk or do you want to be with me? I love you, Randy, but I love Kirk too, she said. 
and started to cry again. Well, you're going to have to choose, I said, almost biting my tongue, and I want to know by tomorrow what it's going to be. If you want to stay with me, you are never to see Kirk again. You're going to have to quit that job and we're going to have to go to counseling. Cindy nodded. I went into our room and pulled out all of her stuff and threw it in the hall. You can sleep in the guest room until you make up your mind. I got home early from work the next day. The truth was that I couldn't concentrate and was less than useless. My stomach had been doing flip-flops all day. At one point during the morning, I thought I was going to lose what little breakfast I had eaten. About six o'clock, Cindy came in with a very nervous look on her face. I was sitting at the kitchen table as I had the previous night. She slipped into the chair opposite me. So have you made up your mind? I demanded. Tears began to run down her cheek. You know that I love you, Randy, but I just can't give up, Kirk. I love him. Also, I blew out a long breath to hide that my heart was breaking. Well, you've made your choice. Cindy just nodded, which cut me worse than if someone had plunged a knife into me. My brain was about to explode. I was going back and forth at one million miles an hour between killing them both and curling up in the corner and crying my eyes out. You picked a real winner, I said sarcastically. Kirk and Susie just had a baby boy. It doesn't bother you that you're going to leave that kid without a father. A tiny bit of anger flashed on Cindy's face, mixed with a little bit of shame. Kirk was planning to divorce Susie even before we got together, so just like that, you're going to throw away almost four years of marriage. I asked, as I continued struggling to hold back not only my temper, but also the tears, to be truthful. Right then, I was seriously considering beating Cindy to a pulp and then go look for Kirk to break his neck. I'm sorry if I've hurt you, Randy, she said softly with tenderness in her voice. I didn't intend for that to happen. I just fell so in love with Kirk and he's in love with me. I have to be with him. My hands twitch with an unbelievable urge to break her neck at that moment, but I knew I had to hold it together. It took all of my powers of self-control to do it, but I finally did. Somewhere deep in the logical part of my brain, I knew there was nothing to be gained by physical violence. I didn't want her to know how deeply she had hurt me, and there was no way that I was going to beg her to stay. I think that is probably the worst thing that any cheated-on husband can do. It is just a sign of total weakness. Okay, I said simply, if you want a divorce, you've got it. A look of confusion filled her eyes, and maybe I imagined it, but also a little hurt. Perhaps she thought I was going to fight to keep her, but I knew in my heart that if she had made up her mind to leave me, there was nothing I could do or say to stop her. Cindy was utterly taken aback by my behavior, but got up and began packing up her stuff. The next day, I went to the bank and our financial advisor. I explained what was happening and withdrew half of the funds in each account. I then opened separate accounts with my name only. I canceled all our credit cards and applied for new ones in my name only. I stopped by a realtor friend of mine and listed our house for sale. Finally, I visited a divorce lawyer with a lot of hatred in my heart. I made sure that Cindy was served at work. I also listed adultery as the cause. The divorce itself was relatively straightforward. Since we'd only been married about four years and had no kids, there was nothing to argue over. We split everything 5050 and went our separate ways. Kirk's divorce was a lot messier. He had a kid less than a year old and Susie had never worked. He had to pay child support and alimony. One thing about Kirk's divorce that I will admit gave me some pleasure. He decided to go cheap on his lawyer. Instead of the spousal maintenance being limited to a year or two, it was set at 15 years. Kirk wasn't happy, but he signed the papers. Two months after the divorces were final, Kirk and Cindy got married. It was a bitter pill to swallow. I spent the first week after the breakup. I was totally lost. I'm not much of a drinker, so that didn't appeal to me. I was consumed for several weeks with trying to come up with some plan to get revenge on both Kirk and Cindy. I'm pretty sure every guy who has ever been cheated on does the same thing. I even started searching on the internet for information about how ex-husbands got revenge on their former wives and lovers. I was in a really dark place. I even bought a gun. Then I began reading story after story about guys who had gotten revenge. At first, my only thoughts of revenge involved violence. Then I started planning to destroy their property. But I quickly realized that both of those ideas would just blow back on me. They were stupid ideas like flattening all their tires, putting sugar in their gas tanks, flooding their new house, and a bunch of other silly ideas. 
The more stories I read about revenge, the more I realized how ridiculous most of them were. I found no way to gain the revenge I wanted. Finally, I sought counseling at my church. The pastor talked to me for almost two hours. He explained to me that the hurt from my wife's betrayal wouldn't go away with any kind of revenge. No matter how much I hurt my former wife or her new husband, the pain would still be there. The pastor's advice was really pretty simple for a person with my kind of pain. He told me that only time and distance would heal my heart. Even though I wasn't sure I believed him, I realized that being near Cindy and not being able to be with her would tear open the wound every time I saw her. I also realized that the pastor was right about one thing. Revenge wouldn't stop the hurt, so I took his advice. That meant I had to put distance between Cindy and me. My opportunity came when I heard rumors that the company was in trouble. Apparently, the firm had entered into a contract with the Defense Department. The deal promised big profits, but there was a downside. Our firm was charged with developing an entirely new software and electronics package for the Air Force's fighters and bombers. It's totally classified, so I can't even begin to tell you about it. Suffice to say that it was going to put the United States head and shoulders above the Russians and the Chinese. That is, of course, if my company could deliver. That evening was delightful. Kelly made me loaf with mashed potatoes, string beans, and sherbet for dessert. It was fun having someone to talk to. Scotty, as his mother called him, was a very outgoing and friendly kid. I discovered that he was a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan like I was. We had fun talking about the team and their prospects for the coming season. I was a real fan and also a season ticket holder. In fact, I had four season tickets on the 50-yard line. The company paid for them because I would take prospective customers to the games. When I didn't have any customers, I'd invite my buddies. And if I couldn't find anyone at all to go with me, I'd go by myself. I'd give the other three tickets away, usually to people who were trying to buy from a scalper. I wish I could go to a game someday, Scotty said wistfully. I can make that happen, I said impulsively. As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I realized that I had overstepped my bounds and quickly tried to fix it. That is, of course, if your mother will approve of it. Scotty looked over at his mother with imploring eyes. All she said is we'll discuss it at the end of the evening. I apologized. I'm sorry about the offer for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It was out of my mouth before I realized what I was saying. But just so you know, I have four season tickets to all the Bucks home games and a ton of frequent flyer miles. If you wouldn't mind him going to a game with me, I'd be thrilled to take him. She stood there looking at me with piercing eyes. It was then that it hit me that I'd made another faux pas. I immediately tried to correct that one, only to create yet another. The invitation applies to you also. After a moment's pause, I stuttered. I, I, I'd get separate rooms for us. You and Scotty would be in one and I'd be in the other. I could feel my face burning in my stupidity. But all that Kelly did was smile. You are the sweetest man, she said with a chuckle. Your expression is priceless. I breathed a sigh of relief. I really didn't want to offend Kelly. I truly enjoyed her company and was hoping that we could get together from time to time. I decided to plunge ahead. Would you mind if I asked you out when I town? If you're with someone, I'll understand. I just really enjoyed having someone to talk to. Kelly studied me for a long moment. Then she smiled. Randy, I've known you since high school. I always thought you were cute and one of the nicest guys, but never considered dating you because I had Jason. Now that I've gotten to know you a little, yes, I'd be pleased if you called me. And I'd love to go see the Tampa Bay Buccaneers with you and Scotty over the following year. I would call Kelly every time I returned to Virginia and we would get together. Several times I booked trips back east when I really didn't have to be there. It wasn't a love affair at first. We were just good friends who enjoyed spending time together, Ida, Kelly, and Scotty, to the final game of the season. That year, the Bucks needed to win to make it into the playoffs, and they did. Scotty was beside himself with joy over the win that night. After Scotty went to bed, Kelly came over to my room and we became more than just good friends. When Kelly knocked on my door, I was watching a local sports station, as they did in an F analysis of the Bucks game. She was the last person I expected to come knocking on my door at that time of night. Is something wrong? I asked with real concern. Is Scotty all right? No, nothing's wrong, she replied with a smile. And Scotty is sleeping soundly, happy that his Bucks are going to the playoffs. I just was hoping that we could have a drink and talk. 
I looked down at my boxer shorts and my t-shirt. Let me put some pants on, I said as I left the door to find my trousers. I thought I had tossed them on the chair in the corner. They weren't there. No need, Kelly said as she pushed the door open and entered frantically. I looked for my pants, which worn on the chair and I couldn't find them on the floor either. I began scanning around the room, which brought a giggle from Kelly. Now my face was fire engine red. If you feel uncomfortable, I can put us on an even playing field. Kelly smiled as she undid her skirt and let it fall to the floor. Now we're both in our underwear. Mix me a drink and come sit down. I went to the mini bar and pulled out two small bottles of rum and two cans of Coke. As I said, I'm not much of a drinker, but I do like rum and Coke occasionally as I mix the drinks. Kelly climbed up on my bed and sat cross-legged. It was hard not to stare at her white-laced panties. After handing Kelly her drink, I looked around trying to find a place to sit. Kelly saw my head darting around and knew what I was struggling. With. She patted the bed beside her. Come on, sit here. I don't bite. Still bright red, I nodded and sat down next to her. I quickly took a big swallow of my drink. I could feel the rum course through my body and I relaxed a bit. We talked for a while, and when we finished our drinks, I took her cup and asked her if she wanted another. She shook her head, and I waited for her to get up. I figured she'd head back to her son. I was totally wrong about that. Not sure what to do. I put the cups in the wastebasket and sat down again. When I did, Kelly kissed me on the lips. It was quick and soft, sending an electrical charge through my body. She saw my surprise and smiled. I've been waiting for months for you to kiss me. I figured that you still thought of me as that high school cheerleader who was unattainable. Let me assure you that I am not that person anymore. Kelly had read me like a book. There have been so many times that I wanted to kiss her but was afraid. I didn't want to take a chance of losing her as a friend. I leaned forward and kissed her. We kissed a long time with our tongues, exploring every part of each other's mouth. She tasted so sweet when we broke apart. I said you are a beautiful and amazing woman. Kelly then laid her head on my chest. That night of sex was even better than my first time with Cindy. Six months after that night, Kelly and I became engaged. Scotty was thrilled that I was going to be his dad. A year after that night, we were married. Jason had been as big a turd as Kelly had claimed. He barely spoke to his son, and he really resented me. Jason was still close friends with Kirk, and every time he came to Kelly's apartment when I was there, he had to tell me how happy they were and what great sex Kirk and Cindy were having. I guess he thought it would make me jealous. I just listened and said nothing. What I did learn was that Kirk was still heading up the human resources department for the company, but Cindy had given up her job to be a full-time mom. I was a little surprised to learn that Kirk and Cindy had three kids now, but it no longer bothered me at all. A spotlight was suddenly shining on me, and loud applause broke out from all around the room. Kelly pulled me to her and gave me a long, passionate kiss. When the commotion ended and the party returned to normal, I turned to where Cindy, Kirk, Jason, and his date were standing. I didn't know what to say to them. Jason seemed pissed and jealousy filled Kirk's face. However, when I glanced at Cindy, there was a look of sadness and loss. I didn't know what to do or what to say, but Kelly did. Kirk. Cindy Jason, it's wonderful to see you, she said as she hugged each one. Then she turned to Kathy and shook her hand. It's a pleasure to meet you, Kathy. I took my lead from my wife. I shook Kirk, Jason, and Kathy's hands and gave Cindy a small hawk. We chatted for a bit and the music started to play in a total surprise, Kelly said. Randy, why don't you have a dance with Cindy and I'll have a dance with my ex-husband, Kathy? Why don't you and Kirk have a dance? Also, I looked questioningly at Kelly, but she just smiled knowingly. So I danced with Cindy. How have you and Kirk been doing? I asked because I couldn't think of anything else to say. Not particularly. Well, she answered, I think we're headed for a divorce. I'm pretty sure Kirk has been cheating on me. I'm really sorry to hear that, I replied. Are you really Randy? She looked at me with total skepticism. I figured you'd say something like it serves you right. I would never say that, I said, shocked at first by the comment. But then I realized there had been a time when I probably would have said something like that. Well, to be truthful, when we first broke up, if you'd come to me, then I probably would have said something like that, but I couldn't hate you. You were my first love and it hurt to lose you. 
but life moves on and so have I. The music stopped shortly after that and tears were streaming down Cindy's face. When I left you, I made the biggest mistake of my life and there is nothing I can do to fix it. I watched Cindy walk away from me and I truly felt sorry for her. I felt Kelly put her arm around me, so I leaned down and kissed her. How was your dance with Jason? I asked. He's still a jerk, she answered with a smile. He actually tried to put the moves on me. He told me that he's ready to settle down and he'd be more than happy to take me back. I just laughed at him and told him why would I want him. When I had the greatest man in the world, I watched Cindy reach their table and sat down. Even from this distance, I could see the tears Kirk and Jason appeared to be having a heated discussion. If I had to guess, I say that Kirk tried to put a move on Jason's date. I thought back to the pain I had felt when Cindy left me. Something like that never truly goes away. It's like a bad cut. It leaves a scar. I also thought of all the planning for revenge that filled me during that time. The pastor had been right. No amount of revenge would have ever stopped my pain. It indeed was time and distance that had healed me. As I said at the beginning, even though I had given up on the idea of getting revenge, I had in fact achieved it. My revenge was exacted in the only way that is truly meaningful to someone who has been cheated on. I was living well, loved, and totally happy.